this is an actor. One of a special breed defined by Webster's Dictionary as one who does a thing. Or one who acts in plays, motion pictures, etc. How come you never answer my phone calls? How come it is so impossible to get hold of you? Look. I want an advance of $250 so I can pay my rent and eat regular for a couple of weeks. You want an advance on what? On what? Oh, on, on what I'll make when I hit it big. What is the matter with you? You're, you're supposed to be an agent. You're supposed to recognize talent when you see it. What do you do with your spare time? Look, it's four months since I've had a day's work out of you. Now, I'm an actor. I want to work. You are not an actor, Donnie. You are a rude little boy. Now, come on, out of here, out of here. Oh, look, don't confuse talent with behavior. Now, the day you understand that, you'll be a better agent. I haven't got you confused, Donnie. You want it straight? Go home to your mother. Get yourself a job in a bank somewhere, adding up numbers, sweeping the floors. Stay away from the theater. It doesn't need you, it doesn't want you. You haven't got a thing that the theater can use. You're fired. You know, if um, you went out with me, I'd ruin you for anybody else. Because I wouldn't marry you. And uh, you wouldn't want to marry anybody else. 200 even. Go home to your mother. You're still fired. <laughs> Yeah, 50 cents worth. Six o'clock tonight, Benton. You ain't back with what you owe me by six o'clock, and I'm taking the 50 cents. Because it's more than nothing. And keep away from my wife. You try conning her again, and I'll fix your face or you'll have a career playing Frankenstein. On the stage, an actor may be as a god, but in life, he's linked to the rest of us by a need to eat, drink, be sheltered from the elements, and to be loved. Donnie Benton, defined by Webster as an actor, defined by life as one who is broke, hungry, and bitterly denied. Queens for a starter. You don't. Donnie Benton, defined by himself as one who will not be denied by fate or by man.
Two killings in one day. Not bad, huh? Three. Just got a report of a third one, Mike. Eighth precinct. Came over just as we drove up. Fun and games. Come on. Well, Doc, you want to make a guess before the autopsy? Death by strangulation, that you know. From the marks on the throat, some kind of length of line, maybe clothesline. Death occurred before the body was put on the floor of the car. Uh, that is to say, it didn't just fall there, it was put there probably to conceal it. Can you give us a rough guess as to time, Doc? From body heat, et cetera, et cetera, I'd say sometime between 10.30 and 11.30 this morning. That fits. Now, the driver pulled out of the garage at 9 this morning. He made three short calls before the last one that he notes here in Queens. That's a pretty empty area out there. Not a bad place for a murder. Mike, I guess we can figure robbery for a probable motive. He knocked this guy off, but he didn't get enough cash, so he had to go after the other two. Seems to me this man needs a particular amount of money. Maybe it's somebody that needs not less than a certain amount. Yeah. Wait a minute. Somebody had to drive this cab back in Queens. Had to be the suspect himself. Doc, would a woman be likely enough to have strength to strangle a man like this? Oh, it doesn't take too much strength, but psychologically, it's a strong arm idea. Probably not a woman. You know, something screwy about this. Somebody has robbery for a motive, and he kills, presumably to prevent identification. But then he takes the risk of driving the cab all the way back from Queens with a corpse in the cab. That's a long ride back from Queens in a subway. Maybe he wanted his money in a hurry, so he wanted to go. There were a lot of cabs doing business. Well, that's as good a starting area as any. Maybe some of these construction workers around here saw him. Why don't you ask? Right. Frank? Thanks. Anything else, I'll fill you in. Do you think you get a report on the other two killings? I can. Would you consolidate the three of them for me? Sure. Maybe we can get a lead out of the pattern. Thanks, Doc. We just turned up and we took the seat out. Worked his way under the seat, probably out of a back pocket. Or maybe there was something put on the seat and the guy sat on it. Anyway, it looks like it came from the driver's seat position. What is this? Looks like lines from a stage play or something. Monk. Well, Jack, that's the only way you're going to get out of there and out of space. They ain't going to give you no rocket, that's sure. You know why? You ain't a monkey, that's why. The name of the play isn't even on here. down your apartment and tell us we could find you up here. Well, that's my next door neighbor. She's uh, taking care of my little girl. Could we uh, talk to you downstairs, Miss Purely? Who are you? We're from the police department. Your husband drive a cab? Sure. Well, what do you two want? Uh, Mrs. Purely, is your husband interested in the theater? I mean, to see an actor. What's that? Well, this is something we found in his cab. Does this belong to him? You two got something more on your mind than just that. Now, Mrs. Purley, why don't we go downstairs, huh? Well what, well, what is it? A complaint against him or something? Ah, oh, listen, he may be a cab driver, but he's still a human being. Some of those people get into, your, into that cab and they, they drive you out of your mind. You can talk all you want to about being a public servant, but... Mrs. Purely, 
please, would you come downstairs? No. You tell me right here. Mrs. Purely, your husband is dead. He's not supposed to be dead yet. I'm only 36 years old, you know. And the little girl's only four years in it and three months. And Harry is... was only 42. I better go downstairs and see what the little girl is doing. She gets on Mrs. Seaton's nerves sometimes. You, you'll excuse me, huh? I'm sure you'll excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Kelly, take it easy. Come on, take it easy. Frank. Come on, take it easy. <laughs> Please believe me, Red. I was as polite as I could be under the circumstances. But I resent his going over my head to you, and I resent your coming back down on me. I know the drivers are nervous, and I'd be nervous too if I was driving a cab and there were three murders in one day. But my detectives can't find the killer riding shotgun in the back of a taxi. If he wants private guards, let him hire them. Hold on a minute, will you, Red? I got another call. Yeah? What? Oh, that's nice. Mm. That's just fine. Just dandy. Now get this, Red. We've now got four murders. Yeah! Look, will you let me go back to being a detective? I'm tired of being a public relations man. Look, Red, if you want to get in touch with me, don't call. Take a cab. <laughs> $135, and I'd like a receipt signed by you. You do know how to write your name, don't you? Don't get fresh from the glamour, boy. This just gets you even. I'll take the next month's rent in advance. <laughs> uh, you know what this buys for me, sir? The uh, special privilege of not having to look at your face for the next 30 days. I'd like that key now. <laughs> Please, let me have the, um, uh, the special, seamless, size nine. What color, miss? Uh, drama. Mm. All I want is a soft, easy road to the same place everybody winds up. It's a bumpy road, and you need a shock absorber. You recognize something, honey? No, no. I'm just thinking, why can't they write women's parts like this? I mean... What do you mean? Well, I mean, it's so good. Baby. Will you read this like a detective's assistant and not like an actress? I've only been a detective's assistant a half an hour. I've been an actress all my life. 
Key Wamis. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. Um, three pair. That'll be three dollars and forty-five cents. Plus ten cents tax at three fifty-five. Okay. Make a note of that. When you get married, you pay for the stockings. Right? Right. I guess so. <laughs> I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. What, what? what? Circle in the square. What's that? A theater in downtown, in the village. Frank. Thanks, Lib. Oh, yes, thanks. up for the park. They got hats on. <laughs> Mr. Hollis, I have given you my assurance that the only reason I picked you for the part of Monk was because I sincerely believe you can play it. Now you've got to get it out of your head that the only reason you got the job was because some ungrateful skunk walked out on us to take a job in Hollywood. He did, but that's not why you're here. You're here because I like you. Kathy likes you. The ghoul's outside waiting, praying that you'll trip and fall off a platform like you. You are to all intents and purposes completely surrounded by affection. So will you kindly accept that as an established fact and get on with the scene? Go on. Oh, you're not right for it. Our Caro, Detective Flint. Well, I hope you've come for him. Does this belong to you? I don't belong to me. Why? What's it all about? The part of Monk. Who's playing it? Well, he's making a stab at it. And there's blood all over the stage. Most of it mine. Has he been here all day? Since 9 a.m. Out of your sight at all? Oh, my nervous manner comes from having to look at him all day long. Why? We're looking for the person who lost this. Take five, Hollis. As a matter of fact, take ten. Call your analyst. All right. If he has an hour free later on, make an appointment for me, huh? Uh, Mr. Flint, I can see that you're here on important business. Well, eight men have played the part of Monk since we opened. They come and they go. It's a flashy part, so we keep on losing them to Broadway, Hollywood, television. I can see where this side might be important to you, but I don't see how I can be much help. Well, of all the fellows that played this role before, do you have their names and addresses? It's probably a list up in the office. Will that help? Oh, and I think I should tell you that uh, we hand a lot of these things out to people who never got to play the part. Is that going to foul you up? Well, we'll see. Right. Thanks anyway. Sure. Thank sure you. Thing. Hollis, you like the creature. Come out, Shadow. Walk into your circle of golden light and bathe in our adulation. Hollis! Get your ifs, ands, and butts out on the stage pronto. All right. And begin. All right. It's hair. Dark brown to black, youthful, classification B, slight wave, healthy texture, subject probably male Caucasian, traces of pomade on the strands. Anything special? Common brand. Okay, keep going. Indications of scalp condition, popularly known as dandruff. You found all this under the fingernails of the fourth cab driver, huh? Yeah. The reconstruction of the fight indicates that the scabby was a little more alert than the other one. And while this guy was strangling him, he reaches his hands up to get at the guy, probably dug his nails in at the back of the guy's head or on the neck. Scratches, blood. You suppose this guy might have scratched him on the face? You can't tell. Epithelial tissue is epithelial tissue. It's the same on the face as on the neck. But the, the length of the hairs and the kind of hairs mixed in with the skin that indicates the back of the neck. What about prints? 
In a public carrier like a taxi, you get a hundred prints, all smeared. Now, I was thinking that maybe one set was repeated in all four cabs. So far, no. You know, it's just one set of prints on top of another one. Everything overlapped, everything smeared, nothing clean. Thanks. Now, look, keep me posted. Don't wait for final reports. If you even begin to find something, yell out. I want to be in on this thing all the way. Now, from the killer's point of view, the M.O. is perfect. You see, a cab driver has got to go wherever he's told. He's always got money on him. Sometimes he's got a lot, sometimes he's got less, depending on how long he's been out. They tell me that even when he first goes out, he's got at least change of a 20. Now, remember this. The victim... Our Carroll, 65th Precinct. ...with his back to the killer when he uses the rope. How about the rearview mirror? Well, maybe he distracts him. Thanks. Maybe he's too fast for him. Maybe he's just lucky. Only one of the four cabbies was able to put up a struggle. I have a startling revelation for you, Mr. Hollis. I like you even less today than yesterday. Well, I never know what you want. Mr. Hollis, I take it that you're aware that there's a potential replacement waiting just back there? Let me introduce you. Mr. Hollis, Mr. Benton. Donnie was our second replacement. And he would have been on the play today if he hadn't had a rather serious falling out with his director. Now, Mr. Hollis, if you will carefully examine your script, I'm sure that you will find that the lines that you're trying so impossibly to memorize have been included by the typist. Take five and learn your lines! Benton's a guy you call us about, isn't he? Yeah, he came in yesterday. Last night. Was he here yesterday between 9 and 11? Oh, I don't know, he might have been outside with the others. Ben's the one we're interested in. But couldn't you settle for Hollis? I may need Ben. We reopen in two days. Good luck. Thanks. Mike, you're the guy that's always telling me not to go jump to conclusions. Now, this time, I'm not jumping, but you're pushing me. Don't I trust your hunches? Yes, but the DA doesn't, and a court won't, and a jury certainly won't. Well, let's bring him in here and have a talk with him. Mike, you're not going to get anything out of this guy. The man is a professional actor. He makes his living by pretending to be somebody he's not. We've got to have facts, Mike. We can't convince this guy we think he's guilty just because we saw him tying knots in a rope. That's right. he just laugh at us. I still hate this undercover stuff. It's, it's like a detective in a book. Mike, I agree with you there. If you've got anything better to offer, I'm going to buy it. I feel the same way you do about it. All right, but how do you contact this Benton guy to handle this undercover stuff? Just a minute. Would you come in, please? A lens, also a light, a spotlight. All right, teaser. A uh, hanging border of curtain behind the proscenium. Border. That's um, a strip of lights hanging behind the teaser. Right. Tormentor. Um, curtains on either side of the stage which prevent the audience from seeing the lighting equipment. Right. Return. Uh, a thickness piece on the tormentor. Right. Spine. You're talking about the way an actor starts working on a part. He, he's trying to find the main line of the scene. Uh, it's, it's a word that's, you know... Wait a minute, girls. It's 4 a.m. Let's have a coffee break, huh? Honey, knowing these things by definition is one thing. But having much at your fingertips is another. Oh, don't worry. And the worst thing that can happen is that he'll think she's a dilettante trying to fake it. This guy's a killer. He'll be aware of anything out of the ordinary. There you go. Thank you. Lynn. Honey, I want you to look at these clothes and tell me if they look right. Why can't you get into the scene? I um, can't find the spine. Good. What are you using? I'm a cat, sleeping on the branches of a tree. 
I'm well fed, but there's a bird down there, and I'm trying to make up my mind whether or not to go after the bird. But basically, I'm just too lazy. What's the sense memory involved? Um, I'm, I'm remembering a meal in front of a fireplace. It's warm and luxurious. The fire flickers, the logs crackle. My skin is warm and dry and smooth. Good. Well, the clothes are fine. Improvisation. Uh, I throw away the script because I want to... I want to deal more directly with the emotion in the scene. I am the person in the play rather than the actor playing the part. I make up the lines. I live the situation. I say what comes into my head as that person. I begin to say and feel and do as the person actually should say and feel and do. I, I know I can handle it. Okay. Here are your clothes. These are the only ones you'll be wearing. Oh, I have something else for you. Here's a driver's license made out in the name of Betty Harkness. Also, there's a registration for a car which you'll find parked in front of your house. The keys for that car are right inside. Now, of course, we're interested in almost anything you can get on this guy, but primarily his fingerprints. Oh, and if it's convenient, if you can steal a hairbrush of his or a comb, we'd like to get a sample of his hair for the lab. Adam, does that mean she's going to have to go to his room? Yeah, that's right. Now, you'd have to keep contact with us because we won't have a tail on you. In this case, it's too risky. So it's up to you to just keep phoning in. Well, that's it. Good luck. Thank you. I'll get your coat. Thank you. Adam, maybe you better see Betty into a cab. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. I'm a policewoman on duty, remember? Bye. 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 Police? Mama? Helen? Mother? Please take me out. Come on, open the soap ducket. It's different from Little Theater in St. Louis, huh? The chimney sweeps. Talk to the sword. Shut up, you. You've got a big mouth. Please, help me up. Henry, Max, come over here. French, Canadian, pea soup. I want to pay. Let them leave me alone. I just repeated words spoken by a man in a dying delirium. They were copied at his bedside as he said them by a police stenographer. Okay. Neighbors are always complaining about the noise, so if you like it, then no applause. Please. Okay, who's next? Come on up here. Who's going to be next? Come on up. You think that's acting? <laughs> tell me. Now I'm wide open. You tell me. I'll do it. Do a small child at an amusement park. Do a blind man fixing a watch. Do a beggar who gets a counterfeit coin. Do the day after the end of the world. Do... D do the cab killer. Okay. This is about the last of the independent acts of man. The taking of a human life. Yeah, everybody wants to do it, but very few of us go through with it. This is where death lives. In your hands. Now you can use your hands for any number of acceptable actions. You can open your mail, you can scratch the tip of your nose, you can touch the soft cheek of a pretty girl, or you can cock a gun. Your hands, they belong to you. And 
buried under the skin of your palm is the splinter of death. That's what you're up against, actor. Now, I'm a man hailing a taxi. Hey, taxi! But I know something he doesn't. He's going to die. Early this morning, he kissed his wife goodbye, he scratched the stomach of his fat little daughter, he put on his peaked hat, and shifted the gears of his destiny. Uh, See, he's stopping to pick up the lonely stranger now, see? Nobody within the sound of my voice is safe from this lonely stranger. Nobody! I know! I am that stranger. Taxi, you uh, want to take me to Queens? Well, I know it's a long ride, but I'll make it worth your while. Okay. Now death is the passenger. And what does death do until the time is right? He musters his conviction. And he reads the summary of life. Marvin Goldbeck, 43. How long have you been out? How much money do you have in your pocket? Now we have the rope. Oh, what's Marvin Goldbeck to me that I should weep for him? Ten times ten Marvin Goldbecks are nothing when weighed against my need. I need money and he has it. Hey, Mac, you sure you got the right address? Yes. I've got the right address. The corner of Destiny Boulevard at Transfiguration. Yeah, why don't you tell me the house number? Oh, well, I, I don't know it, but I know the house when I see it. Keep driving. Yeah, okay, Mac, it's your dough. <laughs> <laughs> and there he is, and here I am. At... <coughs> hey! I got a wife. <coughs> and a kid. <coughs> Parker? Now you know the job is really yours. Benton's no threat. Think of it, Hollis. You've got security. Shut up. Well, we've got the guy's address. I want you to go there and get a complete report on him. I want to know what he wears, what he eats, who his friends are, how much dough he's got, what his hobbies are, and where he's likely to hide when he runs away. And I promise you, he won't run far enough to get away this time. I shouldn't even talk to you. Oh, I've been very busy, Ma. 
Oh, I worried so about you not working. When you don't work, you don't eat properly. <laughs> I'm fine. I got lonesome for you. I thought I'd surprise you. Well, a nicer surprise couldn't happen to me. It's just... Oh, there's some fresh coffee just made up. Here, I'll give you some. You know, you're not going to believe this, but just last night I dreamed I was going to see you. Ma, can, uh... Can you lend me some money? Sure. There's a little round someplace. Here. Oh, no. What's mine's yours, you know that. Yeah, thanks, Ma. Look, uh, I have to go. But you just got yeah, here. I got an appointment, Ma. Well, you, well, let me give you a piece of cake, and, and you can take it with you, and then I'll feel better. You can eat it later on in the day. There you are. Put an apple with it. No. I worry about you so when you're not working. The hours you keep. so thin. Thanks, Ma. Your obedient servant. At your service, ma'am. Thank you, John. So sure. Mrs. Benton, do you have any idea where he was going when he left you? No. No, he never told me anything. He was a quiet boy. Except at nights, when I'd hear him crying. Oh, he, he didn't cry every night. He was a beautiful boy. And that kind of bothered his father. His father used to rub dirt on his face and try to teach him to fight. Once he had the star roll, Galahad, and the story about King Arthur and his knights, and he brought his costume home to show me. His father always thought play acting was sissy. When he saw him dressed up like that, he went kind of mad. He dragged him out to the barn. Tied him up. And beat him with a rope. Donnie played that part anyway. And I, I've got a picture in, of him in here in his costume. Everything good that ever happened to him was in this book. Everything. I'm sorry, Mrs. Benton, but your son is in big trouble. And we're going to have to pick him up. Please. Try not to hurt him. to see so many of you here today, even though we've only got a single part left to cast. 
I'm gratified because you so obviously believed our advertisement and the plugs that we got in the trades, that this will be an open call, and it is. Now, any one of you may read, and one of you will be cast in the part of Monk at my theater in Houston. Now, I will stay as long as anyone cares to read, and I will hear all of you before I make my decision. All right? Why don't we start with you? Well, Jack, that's the only way you're gonna get out there and out of space. They ain't gonna give you no rocket, that's sure. You know why? You ain't a monkey, that's why. Jack, that's the only way you're going to get out there and out of space. They ain't going to give you no rocket, that's sure. You know why? You ain't a monkey. That's why. Well, thank you very much. I'll let you know. Good night. Good night. Sorry we wasted your time, Mrs. Sutter. I thought it would work. I guess the headlines killed it. I thought it would work, too. An actor who wants to get out of town? A, a part that he's absolutely perfect for to play out of town? Maybe he didn't see the notices in the newspapers. <sighs> Lieutenant, an actor has a built-in radar. He doesn't need to see a notice about a reading. He just knows. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks again. Mrs. Sutter? I waited till everybody left. Now, I'd like five minutes of your time. I'm afraid that we're all through for today. Why don't you come back tomorrow? No. I can't do that. Let me read for you now, and you'll know. I've played Mum. Yeah, see, I've got all the notices. Only, uh, I got ill, and I had to leave. When do you go back to Houston? As soon as I cast the lead in a day or two. Have I seen your work? What's your name? <laughs> Why don't you take off those goggles? Let me see your face. <laughs> I have Monk's face. I am Monk. There isn't anybody else. Look, um, you're going to hear a lot of things about me. Now, they're, they're not true and they don't matter. Well, now, what sort of Please. things? And when you're ready to leave, I'll meet you at the station. See, I'll, I'll just be another actor. I'll have another face. Please let me go with you. Look, it's late. I'm really awfully tired. If I read you now, I'd be, I'd be doing you an injustice. Why don't you let me call you in the morning? Where are you staying? No. Look, do just on one scene. Let me read one scene and you'll know you'll have your monk. Please. I want to say something to you. I want you to get angry. Why don't you give yourself up, Don? You must understand. You must know what it means to have to act. 
I'm, I'm all hollow inside without that. Nothing else fills me. Nothing. No body. All right. Foolish, huh? Like the guy who turns off all the gas jets in his house but still has to get back and check them. Mike, I left Betty Harkness alone. That was a mistake, my mistake. She died because I was wrong. Okay, so I'm being overcautious. I'm gonna get Mrs. Sutton and I'm gonna stay with her till she gets on that train tonight. Then when I go home, I'll be able to sleep. I'll be right out. Shake it up, will you? We'll be waiting for you. But you're going to tell me what's illegal. An end to pain. Is that illegal? Or is it illegal to want to leave a world alone when that world is one nightmare? One pain. One endless, interminable suffering, dwindling toward the grave. Yeah, what's illegal? The nature of the human animal is that it takes what it wants. And I can name you 100 species now extinct because... They had something we wanted. And we took it. Here's to pleasure. Who's that? Don. You're a wonderful actor. I've been trying to tell that to people for a long time. Step closer, I'll jump. Don't try it. You won't make it. You want to see me try? What's the use? There's no audience. Jack, you got me all wrong. I play for myself. There I 
eight million stories in the naked city. This has been one of them. Film presentation from Columbia Pictures, produced by Herbert B. Leonard.